let's take a look at the landing gear hydraulic system of the Piper Aero. Now this system contains a lot of moving parts and unfortunately there's not a lot of great resources to explain what's going on within this particular system. But the resources that we're going to use uh, to dissect the system is going to be the POH for the Piper Aero and the Piper Aero service manual that your A&P will use to perform any type of service uh, on the system. Now I found that the service manual, whether it's for the Piper Aero or for the Piper Aero Turbo, will give a much cleaner description of the working parts within the landing gear system. We'll start from the top to the bottom, and we're just gonna use the schematic that's given to us in the POH for the Piper Aero. And for a system like this, we can draw it out if we want, but when we're given a schematic, there's really no need to draw it out and reinvent the wheel when we can just reference it in our POH. So starting at the top, we see the reservoir. Now, the reservoir is simply where our hydraulic fluid or hydraulic oil is stored, and we can take the fluid from the reservoir or we can deposit it back into the reservoir, depending on if we're cycling the gear up or down. This here is a filter, and it simply just filters out any contaminants. Over here, we have a high pressure control valve and a thermal relief valve. And on this side, we have a low pressure control valve. And you might hear people refer to the gear up hydraulic flow as the high pressure side, or the gear down hydraulic flow as the low pressure side. And what we should point out is that we need to maintain a higher pressure within the lines that hold the gear up as opposed to the hydraulic lines that will extend the gears down. When the gear is up, we're fighting against gravity to keep it up, and we need more pressure to keep that gear up as opposed to letting the gear down. Gravity is a big help when we're letting that gear down. So we mentioned there's that high pressure control valve and the low pressure control valve, and as that pump is pumping out fluid into the hydraulic lines, if we're extending the gear, we don't need as much pressure and the low pressure control valve will dump fluid back into the reservoir when the pressure in the line is greater than about 650 PSI or pounds per square inch. And then when we are retracting the gear, we need a higher pressure to bring that gear up. So the higher pressure control valve will dump excess fluid into the reservoir when the pressure in the line is greater than about 2,250 PSI or close to it. The uh, thermal relief valve next to it is based on the principle of thermal expansion. So when a fluid increases in temperature, it expands and the pressure rises. So just like on a hot day, air is considered a fluid and the air expands and the pressure levels expand in the atmosphere, well, the same principle is applied with hydraulic fluid. And when we have thermal expansion, we need a valve to regulate that pressure and hence our thermal relief valve. So that's kind of a real basic introduction to the differences in pressure that occur in the hydraulic system. And before we go any further, let's first talk about how the pump actually pumps the fluid. So what is the driving force that causes this pump to move? Well, the pump is actually driven by electricity, and just like the rest of our electrical system, we will occasionally run into a contactor, otherwise known as a solenoid. We might refer to it as a solenoid or a master relay. And the contactor simply opens and closes a circuit. So the solenoid is not shown in the schematic, but we just have to know that it's there. And when we turn on our electrical system, we flip our master switch. And when we do this, we're using a battery contactor. And this is just an example. Uh, we're using a battery contactor to close the circuit between our battery and the electrical components of the aircraft. Well, we can do a nearly identical process when it comes to turning on or off our electrical hydraulic pump for the landing gear. And we simply do this by raising the landing gear handle in the cockpit to either the up or down position. And as soon as we lift that handle up or down, the handle is directly tied to the pump solenoid. And this will in turn close the circuit 
between the pump solenoid and the electrical bus, which is now supplying electricity to the hydraulic pump itself. So another way to look at the solenoid um, that's not depicted in the schematic is that it's simply just a switch that will connect the electrical flow um, to the hydraulic pump itself. So now we know how the pump is able to operate. Uh, we'll run through the process of putting the gear up and down. So let's say we want to retract the landing gear. We take off, we're above 200 to 300 AGL, and we have a positive rate of climb, we have a safe airspeed, and we say gear up, and we move that handle to the up position. So moving that handle up, the pump solenoid will close the circuit, providing electricity to the pump itself, and as the pump moves in this direction, fluid will be sucked from the reservoir and pumped into this line right here. As the fluid is being pumped out, the pressure needs to be regulated, and we accomplish that with the high pressure control valve, which will open due to a pressure of about 2250, uh, give or take, PSI or greater. Uh, so we can just say 2250 PSI. And that fluid containing excess pressure will then be dumped into the reservoir, like we discussed. So as that fluid's being pumped, it will make its way past the gear check valve, which just like any other check valve is meant to allow fluid to only flow in one direction. And in this case, it's to avoid any back pressure flowing in the opposite direction. So the fluid flows past the gear up check valve down this line. And before it makes it to the manifold, we can call this the pressure switch manifold. It flows through an orifice. Now this can also be referred to as a snubber orifice. And the purpose behind this is to reduce the rate of flow of a fluid into pressure instruments. So the orifice is simply just a small opening and it limits that rate of flow. And what this does is it dampens the shock of fluctuating pressure. So for example, we want the gear to close and open relatively slowly and gradually. And in the Piper Arrow, it takes about seven seconds according to the POH. And we would rather have that gear open and close gradually as opposed to having the gear smack shut or smack open. So parts of the gear could break or become damaged if we smack them open uh, or close too quickly. So anytime you see an orifice uh, listed in the schematic, uh, they're simply just trying to reduce that shock of pressure increasing or decreasing in the system by restricting how much fluid we allow to flow through that orifice. So it flows through the orifice here and now into the manifold, which the manifold, we have two of them in the schematic. They will just connect the hydraulic lines to all three hydraulic cylinders. And as the fluid flows through this manifold, it is measured by a pressure switch. Now, earlier we talked about how do we get the pump to turn on? Well, we need to close that circuit through the pump solenoid, which will supply electricity to the pump, but we never discussed how do we get that pump to turn off? Or how do we open the circuit connecting the electricity to the pump? Well, that's accomplished through the pressure switch. When the pressure reaches around 1800 PSI, the pressure switch will activate and it will open the circuit of the pump solenoid, which shuts off the electricity to the pump. So it takes about 1800 PSI to keep our landing gear in the up position or retracted. And if our pressure dips down to around 1500 PSI, the pressure switch will then force the circuit to close in the pump solenoid, which will then supply electricity back to the pump and get that PSI back to 1800, where the pressure switch will then open the circuit again. Now this is very similar to the pressure switch protecting the Hobbs meter in a Cessna 172. So the pressure switch in the landing gear is basically a monitoring system. It's monitoring the PSI needed to keep that landing gear in the up position. And if it monitors that PSI is not where it should be,
it will turn that pump on to increase that PSI. So basically what we should take away from this is that if our landing gear is retracted in the up position and we still hear the pump activating during cruise flight, there's some sort of malfunction or leak within the hydraulic system and we need to seek maintenance as soon as possible. So after the fluid flows past this pressure switch manifold, it'll be rooted in three different directions. And as we can see here, it fills up the hydraulic cylinders for the main gears and the nose gear from the bottom. And as that piston is forced upward, the gear is also forced up and retracted. Now, it's a good time to point out that anytime we have fluid flowing in one direction, to the bottom or top of the cylinder, we have fluid flowing in the opposite direction from either the top or the bottom cylinder. For example, uh, if we use the gear up hydraulic flow that we just mentioned, the hydraulic fluid will fill up the cylinder from the bottom and the fluid that was originally inside the cylinder will be pressed out and flow through the top valve of the cylinder and it'll be sent back to the reservoir and it'll travel through these lines and through this manifold and it will flow past the shuttle valve and get deposited back into the reservoir. Now in order to get a complete picture of what's going on, let's explain a few more moving parts and, and then examine the hydraulic flow um, as we're extending the gear down for landing. So we mentioned the shuttle valve. Let's think of this right here as a piston and this is a spring that will move the piston in the shuttle valve to the left and to the right. And as you can see with the arrows, the um, piston will move to the right during the gear up cycling and to the left when cycling the gear down. Now here is an opening sending the fluid to the reservoir and here is an opening connecting the shuttle valve to the manifold. So how does the piston know in which direction to move? Well, it all comes down to the hydraulic pump and which direction it's pumping fluid for either a gear up or a gear down. So for example, we can see the gear down cycling will move the shuttle valve piston to the left. And that's because the pump will pump fluid through these lines right here, compressing that piston, which will then move that fluid through the manifold. Another moving part that's not labeled or really discussed is the gear up check valve piston, which is located right here. And as the fluid is pumped for a gear up cycling or retracting the gear, the pressure flows through here and it basically bypasses the gear up check valve piston, but the fluid compresses the spring on the gear up check valve, which allows the fluid to flow through this line and to the pressure switch manifold when we extend that gear um, and cycle it down. But how do we get that fluid to flow back to the pump when the gear up check valve is in the way? Well, when the pump is pumping fluid to extend the gear down, it pumps in this direction through these lines and the pressure forces that gear up check valve piston to compress the gear up check valve and it basically moves it out of the way so uh, fluid can flow through this line and past the gear up check valve supplying that fluid back to the pump for that low pressure flow on this side. The last thing that we will discuss is the emergency landing gear extension. Now, as we see in the schematic, the emergency landing gear system is located right here. As soon as the emergency landing gear extension is engaged, the pressure in both manifolds becomes equalized and without any pressure in one direction or the other, it enables the gear to drop simply on its own weight. So it basically dumps the hydraulic pressure within the landing gear system and it allows the gear to free fall and then lock into place. Now it contains a lever in the cockpit which can be placed in three different positions. 
There's the auto extend position, the auto extend override position, also called the off position, and the manual emergency gear extension position. So inside the cockpit, it will look just like this, right next to our flaps lever uh, in between the seats. And you'll see in the schematic that it shows a diaphragm, an automatic gear down pressure sensing chamber, a static port, a ram port, and basically uh, what's happening is that uh, if our lever is placed in the auto extend position, our gear will automatically extend if we have no power and we're below 87 knots or about 100 miles per hour. And we know this because in the emergency procedure section of the POH, it gives us a procedure to follow in the event that our gear does not cycle down. And it states that when the lever is in the normal or disengaged position, airspeed should be reduced to below 100 miles per hour, which is 87 knots. And this is the activation airspeed that will trigger the emergency gear extension. How does our system know to deploy the gear under those conditions? Well, back to the schematic, we see the static and ram air entering into a diaphragm and an automatic gear down pressure sensing chamber. Now these instruments are located underneath the seats and they look just like this. And what happens is we actually have sort of a pitot mast on the side of our plane, just like this. And on our particular arrow, it's located right here, and it sticks out on the left side of the aircraft, just like our pitot mast under the wing. And this will give the instrument in the landing gear system the proper speed conditions for our system to sense, and that's how it will basically be able to detect whether to deploy the gear or not in an emergency situation where we have no power. So this is the landing gear system in the Piper Arrow. And it's not the most complicated, but there are a lot of moving parts and they can be very difficult to understand at times, even for me. And if you have any comments, questions, concerns, maybe you wanna add something, feel free to leave a comment below so we can all see there's always more to be learned.